Hello, Internet. Yes, good day, wherever you may be. Um, I'm going to have to start off, although you may be seeing this somewhere later in the month of February 2023. This is recorded on the 1st of February 2023. Why is that important? Simply because this is the SAF's birthday. The South African Air Force was founded, and I'm not going to go any further with that, because I have a man here today, this evening, today, whenever you watch this, that I want to welcome. Uh, he has become a WhatsApp friend to me. We share the odd chuckle once in a while. Uh, also, he has become a friend on a different level because he keeps me fed with historical facts, which is great. And he also keeps me fed with essays and the likes, which is also great. So I'm going to say, today we have with us Philip Weyers. Yes, you staff people, you'll all go, yeah, 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 we know him. For sure you know him. SAF Association, yes. Key to so many people, SAF Association. But I'm going to allow Philip to tell us why, particularly, and I think I think he sort of led me into this without me realizing that it was going to be happening on the 1st of February, and he's got a reason why he led me into the 1st of February. As I've said, it's the SAF's birthday. But I'm saying no more. Apart from the fact that we do really appreciate your time and that you came to Legacy Conversations to share some of the very, very informative history of the SAF and the SAF Association later on. Thank you, sir. Much appreciated. Well, see, thank you so much. It's um, a privilege to be with you and to talk about the... Uh, the South African Air Force on this its 103rd birthday. Um, as you mentioned, um, the SAF was founded um, on the 1st of February uh, 1920. And uh, in fact, it was uh, there's quite a lot that happened around that time and the SAF, in fact, um, it came into being, but it was backdated to, to the 1st of February. Um, but to Tell you the story about about the SAF. Um, I'm going to have to start um, some way before, in 1870, at a place called Rebeck West, north of Cape Town, north and northwest of Cape Town, over the hill from Longabar, um, when young Christian Smuts was born on the 24th of May. Um, I'm going to refer to him. Um, throughout as the Obas, um, it's how I've always spoke or heard of him and spoken of him, um, and it's how he was known uh, to the family. Um, and uh, he was born on a farm called Boerventplaats or Boerplaats, which was a half of the farm Ungegent. And his father was a man of quite some standing. A successful farmer, a member of the Cape Parliament. And uh, just an interesting aside while we talk about his father, when his father eventually decided to stop farming and retire, he bought himself a house in, in the town of Rebeck West um, and very deliberately bought the property next to his very best and lifelong friend. And in the fence between the two properties, a gate was placed so the two old bullies wouldn't have to walk around to have coffee with each other. And that is interesting because the neighbor and lifelong friend was the father of D.F. Malan, who was later to become uh, Prime Minister of South Africa. And now the Obos was the second of what was eventually nine children. Um, the um, the Obas's father was married twice, and um, he was not destined to go to school. He was the second son. He had a brother 
an elder brother called Mechil. And Mechil was the only one, as was customary in those days, um, who was destined to receive a formal education. Um, and fate would have a, a, a game to play here because in um, 1882, when Obos was 12, um, Mechil died. And they said to the Obos, well, um, you're going off to school. And so it happened that at the age of 12, the Obos was sent to a school called the Ark uh, in Rebek West, where he was to receive formal education. Um, it is interesting that the Obos' father at that, that stage um, described his son, Jan Christian Smuts, as a queer fellow without much intelligence. Just goes to show how wrong a father can sometimes be. Um, four years later, the Obas matriculated. Um, it took me 12 years of hard labor, and I'm not quite sure how one does it in four years. I feel somewhat deprived, though. And uh, he went off to the Victoria College in Stellenbosch, which we now know as Stellenbosch University or Marty's, where he studied sciences, arts and sciences. And um, he graduated in 1891 uh, with double degrees in science and literature. Um, just an interesting aside here. Um, he thought that he was going to be given a credit for Greek and discovered to his shock that, in fact, he wasn't going to be, get a, be getting a credit for Greek and would have to pass the exam, write and pass the exam. So he locked himself up in his room and six days later came out of his room able to speak, read and write Greek, um, which is actually, I think, quite remarkable. It is also this time that at this stage that he met um, Sibella Margarita Kricher um, of the home Klein Libertas in Dorf Street in Stellenbosch. Um, also a well-known family. Um, Ace Kricher was a cousin of hers. Um, and Alice Kricher, the, the actress, is also family. The Obos did so well at Victoria College that he won the Ebden Scholarship to go and uh, read law at Christ College in Cambridge in England, which he did. And it was evident as well that this fellow was fairly intelligent. And during his time there, he wrote the Law Tripos, which is a two-year course traditionally. He wrote it in one year, both Tripos, um, both modules of the Tripos, and achieved marks that certainly 20 years ago had never been equaled, much less bettered. And... Fairly recently, in the mid-80s, Lord Todd, who was the Vice Chancellor of Cambridge, was asked who the five most brilliant students were to ever attend Cambridge. And he said, and he thought about it and said, well, there weren't, there weren't five. There were only, in fact, three. Moulton, Darwin, and Smuts. Now, the South African Air Force has its roots that date back to 1912 when Brigadier General Christian Bayers was Commandant General of the Fledgling, Fledgling Union Defence Force. Now, this is the same General Bayers who was a Boer general. And at the time of the declaration of war, particularly when the, uh, the Union Defence Force um, went to Deutsche Südwest Afrika, um, General Bayers found it so incorrect principally that he resigned his commission and led the rebellion, which, which caused a lot of internal Afrikaner strife at the time. And as we know, he was hunted down and subsequently drowned in the Vaal River, trying to cross the river, uh, which was a great tragedy. And it affected the Obas Minister because he and General Bayers um, were, were close, one might say, and they were colleagues. They were um, war soldier um, friends, and there are very few friends that are closer, in fact, than, than soldiers who have served together, as you and I both know. 
1911, the age of aircraft arrived in South Africa when a London-based group named the African Aviation Syndicate Limited arrived in South Africa to promote the science and practice of aviation in South Africa. The company arrived in Cape Town accompanied by two pilots, Cecil Thompson Patterson and Evelyn Driver, as well as a French Blériot aircraft, and interestingly, a South African built Patterson biplane. Um, as an aside here, I tend to do a lot of asides. As an aside here, there is a replica of the Patterson biplane at the Air Force Museum at Swakop, um, which is actually very interesting. It's a very flimsy construction, I must say. Um, amongst the people who, um, well, let me get there in, 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 in sequence. In 1912, General Bayers undertook a trip to Europe. Um, on the instruction of, of the OBAS as Minister of Defence. He witnessed man, military manoeuvres in Switzerland, France, Germany, and England, and uh, was given specific instructions. Prior to his departure, visit the British Army's, the British Army's Aviation School for Salisbury Plain to obtain, and I quote, as many details as possible for a guide in establishing a military aviation school in South Africa on a small and economic scale. General Bayes returned to Pretoria much enthused about what he had seen, particularly regarding the use of aircraft in conflict. He said that the use of aircraft should be a great saving in horses and men. He foresaw great things for the use of aircraft in future operations. In 1913, the Government Gazette, Government Gazette in South Africa published an advert inviting applications for officer aviators to form the nucleus of the South African Aviation Corps to be founded in terms of the Defence Article 119.2 of 1912. Five pilots went off to Kimberley where they were trained. Um, amongst them, um, the gentleman who was to become General Kenneth van der Spey, um, who at one stage was the oldest living fighter pilot on earth. He was a man of, of prodigious humor, an erect and tour, and he had a capacity for consuming alcohol that was second to none. And um, at any rate, the five qualified pilots did not, not have much time before they were deployed. In 1914, General Louis Buerta invaded German Southwest Africa. This done at the request of London to neutralize Wallfish Bay, Walfish Bay, and Swakopmund, a shipping port. The way it worked was that uh, General Berta took the northern half of the country and the Obas the southern half, and that was the first victory, allied victory, of the First World War. In 1917, the Obas was sent by Prime Minister General Berta to London to attend the Imperial Conference in March of that year. And on the 17th of August, um, let me interject there to say that the Obas, when he arrived in England, um, was invited to join the War Cabinet as he was a man who was identified as somebody who could assist the war effort enormously. It is also interesting when he joined the War Cabinet, he was the only soldier, only person on the War Cabinet with combat experience. All the others were politicians or uh, starts Omtenara, civil servants. When the Obas got to, to London, London was being bombed primarily by Zeppelins, um, by the Germans, and was caused, they were causing quite a lot of damage. They were causing a lot of casualties uh, in London, in Coventry, and they said to him, well, okay, we have a spot of bother here. You and the Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, form a two-man commission to work out how we can stop the Germans bombing London and Coventry and other British cities. And the Obos went off and he, uh, David Lord George said to him, listen, I'm a Welshman. We are good at mining coal and singing. We're not good at much else. So it's up to you. The first report the Obos presented was in July. And this detailed how to deal with the German threat and the German bombing, which basically was, which was fairly simple. Uh, the concentration of anti-aircraft capabilities uh, primarily and some 
fighter uh, reaction, um, defensive air reaction from the Royal Flying Corps in those days. Dobos wasn't finished though, and on the 17th of August 1917, he presented a report to Parliament in England, which has subsequently become known as the Smuts Report. This report was described by Air Vice Marshal Tony Mason of the Royal Air Force in 1986 as a single most important document in the history of air power. The sentiment was repeated in private correspondence I had with the Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force in 1995, General Ronald Al Fogan, who uh, repeated much what Tony Mason said. In this report, the OBAR suggested that air power should have an offensive rule, a role, not just a defensive one, as was Britain's practice at the time. And allow me please to quote from the report, which says, air service on the contrary, can be used as an independent means of war operations, far from and independently of both army and navy. As far as can be presently foreseen, there is absolutely no limit to the scale of its future independent war use. And the day might not be far off when aerial operations with their devastation of enemy lands and destruction of industrial and popular centers on a vast scale may become the principal operations of war to which the older forms of military and naval operations may become secondary and subordinate. In our opinion, there is no reason why the Air Board should no longer, should no longer continue in its present form and there is every reason why it should be raised to the status of an independent ministry in control of its own war service. Based on the recommendations of his report, General Smuts managed without detriment to the Army and Navy to pull all the loose ends together. And on the 1st of April 19, the Royal Air Force was born, the first independent Air Force to exist anywhere. Now, South Africans had featured strongly in the Royal Flying Corps during World War I with Andrew Bocum Proctor topping the heap with the most kills amongst all the Empire's airmen, that being 41, and holder of the Victoria Cross, the Military Cross, the Defence, the Distinguished Flying Cross, and the Distinguished Service Order. Among his contemporaries was one Colonel Helpiris Andreas van Reinefeld, who was to play a significant role in this establishment of our own South African Air Force. Colonel Sapir was best known amongst the South Africans for the epic flight he took with Sir Quentin Brand in, to, from England to South Africa in a Vickers Vimy called the Silver Queen. D the trip eventually required three different aircraft, a replacement Vimy um, after a crash in Bulawayo. And it wasn't the first crash they were able to resuscitate things prior to that. And they landed just east of Pretoria before proceeding to Cape Town. Um, interestingly, Sir Quentin Prand um, remained in the Royal Air Force and was to end up as an Air Vice Marshal, a man of substantial capabilities and achievement. When General Smuts decided to start an Air Force in South Africa, Sir Pierre was the man he chose to make it happen. Sir Pierre was not a particularly pleasant person on a personal level. Um, he didn't like little boys, I remember very well. I don't think he ever liked me very much, but then I was just a little, a little oaky. Um, but he was a close friend of, of my grandfather's. Um, and they say that he possessed the rarest of all qualities. He was a leader of men. So Pierre Frenefeld was summoned from Cologne, Cologne in Deutschland to London and was told, I want you to go back to South Africa and start an Air Force. Now the future of the, of the SAF got off to a flying start with the Imperial Gift from the United Kingdom. The Imperial Gift was co comprised 113 aircraft and included steel frames for 20 hangars and everything else to require to start and operate an air force. That went as far as vehicles, um, canvas for wings, wing struts, um, gum and paint. And those 20 hangars were erected 
on the site. Um, 22 Morgan in extent, some two miles east of Roberts Heights, which was later Fertrecker Werchter and is now Tarbot Twani. And that property had been purchased to become the South First Airfield. This airfield was named Swartkop and is still active today. And in fact, some of the Imperial gift hangars are amazingly still in daily use. Air Force Base Swartkop is the oldest military active airfield in the world. I had a, um, a discussion, shall we say, which got just a little animated with a past member of the SAF who joined the United States Air Force and doesn't he'll hesitate to tell us, in fact, on Facebook just how good the United States Air Force is, which of course it is, but it all seems to be to be a little um, treasonish to continue to feed us with, with that. Um, he said that Swarkup doesn't qualify as the oldest military base in the world because it was an airfield and later an air station. I said, well, you know, whether it's an airbase, an airfield, an air station, or a station, or anything else, it's got a runway which operates military aircraft. So at the end of the day, um, they are all the same. And on that basis, Swarkup is the oldest. The South African Air Force was officially established on the 1st of February. 1920, as we have mentioned, a day that is still celebrated each year. What I should possibly mention, because it's been quite contentious in, in South Africa this year, also on Facebook, also by a gentleman who perceives, perceives himself to be South Africa's Chuck Yeager or Bob Hoover. Um, it is now called the Prestige Parade on the 1st of February, or the, uh, a day close to the 1st of February, um, and while the protagonists on Facebook might not understand that, um, the reality is that there are elements, particularly um, of the recent past, um, and most notably the then chief until a year ago um, of the South African National Defence Force, who was of the firm conviction that the South African Air Force in fact started in 1994, not 1920. And in deference to the power that he held, um, he was incidentally a Zuma appointee. Uh, they have taken away what um, we renamed what we used to call Air Force Day, and there's now the Prestige Parade. Um, I don't have too much of a problem. I've got other things to worry about. At the end of the day, um, the day is celebrated, which is what is important. And Interestingly as well, the Australian Air Force, where I find myself, uh, have a contention that they are the second oldest Air Force in the world, not the South African Air Force. And they say that um, it all goes about not the, the, the date on which autonomy was given to an, an, an air arm of service, but when you actually did things. And I have a fault with that. And they posted a thing recently on Instagram, Instagram, if I'm not mistaken, saying that, uh, oh, does it, when we, when we were playing cricket, the test cricket here, and um, I said, I believe that the a comment that the South Africans are as comfortable with their position as the Australians would seem to be with theirs. Uh, and I said, what is irrefutable, though, is that um, Jan Smuts started the whole concept of having an independent Air Force, starting with the Royal Air, Royal Air Force, and then in terms of my belief in the South African Air Force, uh, the only real pretender to the throne of being uh, the oldest Air Force is the Finnish Air Force. Um, and that does appear to be somewhat contentious, but it is not something about which the Finns um, choose to uh, make a noise. And unfortunately, that is it for the, for the moment. I'll, I'll get on to the um, onto South African Air Force Association uh, shortly, very, very briefly. I would like to do that in, in more detail in, in due course. Um, but just a footnote I have here talking about the OBAS. The Commonwealth, um, of which so many countries are members, um, Australia is a member, South Africa was 
I remember then left the Commonwealth and came back in 1994. Um, Canada, um, I think Zimbabwe was turfed out because of their misdemeanors. Uh, not their misdemeanors, should we say, the government's misdemeanors. But I thought it might be of interest while we're talking about the OBAS, um, also from the same time period, to just to explain how the Commonwealth, as we know it, came about. And uh, on the 15th of May 1917, the OBAS addressed both houses of parliament, in which he said the following, and I quote, I think the very expression empire is misleading because it makes people think we are one community to which the term empire can appropriately be applied. We are a system of nations. We are not a state, but a community of states and nations. If we are not an empire, why call ourselves one? If we are something new, we had better give ourselves a new name. Let us take the name of Commonwealth. This is the fundamental fact we have to bear in mind, that the British Commonwealth of the Nations does not stand for standardization or denationalization, but the for the fuller, richer, and more various life of all the nations that are comprised in it. This is how the Commonwealth, as you know it, had its beginnings. And Pussy, that's, that's about it, about um, the SAF and, and the OBAS. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the OBAS and about the SAF. Um, I retain a passion for, for my Air Force. Um, it's much maligned at the moment, underfunded, grossly underfunded as we are all aware. But the element for which I retain a passion, two in fact, are one, it's history, uh, about which I'm extremely sentimental, and the other, is its personnel. The, 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 the South African Air Force is exceedingly fortunate to have some extraordinarily competent, capable, dedicated personnel who somehow managed to make a, a dozen egg omelette with six broken eggs. And uh, I stand in great respect of them all. Many, many of, of them remain friends of mine. And uh, I, I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, to tell you about it. Thank you, Fossey, very much indeed for having me as a guest. Philip, no, we have to thank you because a few things went through my mind there. Um, I've, I've only two questions for you. Well, one is a sort of a question and the other is a sort of a statement. But we need this information to be captured. So I say that's why I am in debt indebted to you and i'm grateful and so will everybody else be we're battling to get a serious staff presence at legacy conversations and more or less i think Chris um jumped on the bandwagon when i put up my hand to do some editing and he thought ah there's a staff manichi i'm gonna grab this oh because he must talk to the staff which i will gladly do so this to me is almost to a degree, a starting point of that. I have spoken with a few other guys, but I think, if I'm correct, no, I have spoken with a, another SAF man. Um, uh, Steve Scott, which I'm sure you your paths would have crossed because Steve is quite respected in the aviation world. But that's beside the point. The point is, I am very, very, very pleased that I can have got you to go that far back. Now, the two questions, I'll, well, the first statement, statement sort of thing. I recall asking you by email a few years ago, and you've answered that already, and I'll go into the your answer now. You're answering me now to that. I asked you, was General Field Marshal, was the OBAS, was he a globalist in the formation of the globalist way of thinking? And with your Commonwealth definition, or even calling the Commonwealth, what he did, you've answered that question. No, he wasn't a globalist. He much believed in my thinking. I think you did answer me at that stage. No, he was, what was the term you used? Would you be prepared to, can you think off the top of your head? Fossi, let me give you a bit more on that. Um, the Obos wrote a book um, 
published, I think, in 1922, called Holism and Evolution, in which he says that every element of life is interlinked. He starts with the grasses, the, the grasses um, that feed the cattle, um, for example, um, or the, the millies that feed the chickens, and so it goes on until it feeds um, humanity. And that found expression uh, towards the end of the First World War, where he wrote a book, The League of Nations, A Practical Suggestion. It was just a little phrase here, short, like a short story. And on, that, on the basis of that publication, which was written in Dutch, by the way, and which Amma Smith translated to, to English, um, President Woodrow Wilson, the American president at the time, thought it was a wonderful idea. And it was, the idea was that uh, there would be a, a forum um, at which uh, international, the, the countries of the world, the nations of the world could get together and discuss matters of common interest or concern. Um, the league came into being and was followed up by the San Remo conference in 1922 at which um, the, the League resolutions were written into international law. Um, that is, for example, and I'm happy to talk to you about that as well one day, is how um, Israel came to be, uh, which only became independent in 1948, as we know, with David Ben-Gurion. But that's a, that's a very interesting story about how Israel came to be um, and just how influential the Obos was in, in, in that whole story, um, which was hugely, um, hugely um, influential indeed. Um, America then, Woodrow Wilson lost the, um, lost the election in America, and then America withdrew from the League of Nations, and that was effectively the end of it. With no America, none of the, if, if the superpowers aren't part of it, then it will have very limited effect indeed. Um, so the interdependency and the uh, cooperation um, dialogue um, was very much up in his mind. Um, he followed that up, as you know, in 1945 in San Francisco with the establishment of the United Nations, where he um, wrote the preamble to the Charter, the Fuerwort, the the forward to the constitution of the of the United Nations. Uh, he was at the first session, and um, I think he'd be very disappointed in in what the United Nations has become. Um, obviously, there are limitations. Uh, the one thing he did for the United Nations, which I only discovered relatively recently, um, was that he proposed a veto. Now, the permanent members. Um, of the Security Council all had the power of veto. And he proposed that the veto be introduced um, against his better judgment and much against his will. Um, because without the veto, there would have been no Russia. No Russia, no United Nations. Um, with the power of veto, um, Russia joined. Um, as we know, they, they were a renegade nation then and they are as much a renegade nation today, certainly in my opinion. Um, so a globalist, um, that's actually a very good question. I, I think in, in, this, in as far as holism goes and the interdependence of, of, of everything living, I suppose to that extent he probably was, um, but I don't think he lost sight of something that is he's often criticized for in South Africa is, is that he cared more about England, the United Kingdom, than he did about South Africa. Um, fingers are pointed to him, um, at him, for example, um, for befriending the, the Boers immediately following the, the Boer War. And he, he befriended them very quickly, even the treacherous and much hated Lord Kitchener. Um, along with Lord French and, um, and various others. And 
that generally, that sort of comment or criticism generally comes from somebody who doesn't know his history. Because the reality is that at the end of the Boer War, um, there were four separate republics in South Africa, all under the rule of England. And the two of those republics involved in the Boer War, the, the Orange Free State and the Transvaal Republic, um, joined then with other, the other British ones, um, Natal and, and the Cape. Um, and the, the, the reason the Herbals befriended um, Mad pallied up to the, to the British um, was very simple. He wanted to achieve union. He wanted um, self-governance of the four, of a unified four republics. And that, as we know, happened in 1910. So I think those folks who criticize him for pelling up to the, the British um, need to read a bit more and speak a bit less. Um, and they'll understand that's why it happened. Um, just as in the science thing was in that time period, in 1912, there was a surplus in the, in the budget of the South African government. And that's when the OBAS proposed the establishment of a Union Defence Force. So the Union Defence Force, which was the precursor, obviously, of the South African Defence Force, which again was the precursor of the South African National Defence Force, um, was also uh, a creation of, of the OBAS. So, um, yeah, I, that's a very long-winded answer to your question. Apologies for that. No, once again, I'm going to say this is history. And, and this is South African history. And this is South African military history. So oh. that's why, why we're here uh, at Legacy Conversations, to have conversations and chats about this. So once again, I say thank you very, very much. Now, the second one... Um, and I, I, I do have to apologize here quickly. Folk, I did not plan to ask Philip these questions. I did not plan to put him on the spot. But I, I know he will, um, when we go offline here, he's going to say to me, Fossi, if you ever do that to me again, I come for your black son. <laughs> but, yeah, no, no. Uh, the, the the point of the matter is this is what why our conversations go about. So we, we're sitting in our front room and I'm, it's, uh, it's, what's the time here? Yeah. It's not even 11, well, it's not even half past 10, and I'm sitting and having a proverbial or a imaginary or call it a virtual, um, yeah, yeah, black bush, yeah, and uh, I, I'm clinking your glass there because, anyway, I'm going to stop waffling. Uh, the second one, is it true that when Swartkop's base was established, the runway was flat. No. Always had that. Always had it. It's, it's the shape of the it's topography of the um, of the land. Mm -hmm. There is uh, there's an um, I think Swartkops, if I'm not mistaken, is zero three two one. There's a diagonal runway that runs between um, Swartkop Base as we know it and Snag Valley, mm -hmm. just down the valley. Mm -hmm. um, that one's a lot flatter. Um, but it also dips down. It also goes downhill. Um, it makes a single, um, a, a declines um, down as you approach Snack Valley. It, it, yes. it, it then, so um, yeah, no, the, the Swakov runway has always been um, uh, lower in the middle than it is at either end. Okay, so that is a vicious rumor that I was fed many, many years yeah. ago. No, that's not true. Once again, this is the function of legacy conversations, is to get rid of those vicious rumors. Okay, <laughs> so well, I, I'm going to ask you all out there, and I hope this video gets massive play. Uh, and I hope down here in the comment section, you ask questions. I'm not going to bother Philip, for a while, I want this to sink in. And then when we come back, uh, depending on your questions downstairs, we can try and structure uh, episode two. So at this point in time, um, I know that that clinking glass, the ice has probably melted because it's Brisbane and it's flipping warm. So I'm going to say I do really, really appreciate this. 
Uh, I'm also going to say, as we always say here at Legacy Conversations, until we meet again, until we chat again, God bless. Thank you, Fossi. It's been a privilege. Thank you very much.